the recording. So here with Mark Horner, we're we're poaching Mark. We're trying to get Mark, who's a very successful Shutterworth fellow, su successful entrepreneur in South America, South Africa, on a textbook project from Shuttleworth Foundation. Trying to get some insight, pull Mark into advising us on the roadmap for Open Source Ecology, Open Building Institute. So the latest progress is that the stuff has not scaled, and the critical reason is that our stuff is difficult. We're changing the world. We're we're going radical on much innovation at the same time, and when we can do things like build our machines in a single day or build a house in five days, we thought, oh yeah, once people see that, the huge economic power, we'd think that, oh, it's going to scale, people are going to take it on and, and follow us. But nobody's able to really replicate that kind of process. The model we're taking is we run immersion training workshops where people pay us for the experience and we sell a product out of this because we've refined our techniques to be so easy to build and so modular. We do module-based design, like say the tractor, we can build in a single day. You build all the modules in parallel and then assemble them rapidly into place. It's something we're pioneering and I think is extremely powerful uh, and could be a new model of, of how people produce in the future in your micro factory setting where a small facility can produce just about anything within local communities, so a new paradigm for production. Now, that's hard, so how do we get people to get there? So right now we're saying, hey, six month immersion training, we get people to be absolute hardcore um, with the expectation that we, t we teach you everything that we know and you take this on as a lifestyle and therefore you're contributing also to the public domain, basically the open source product design once you graduate because you're capable of doing that. We teach you everything from how to build things, machines, house, like in, take the Open Building Institute immersion training. We're going to teach you how to build machines to build the houses. We're going to teach you how to build the houses, how to design the houses, etc. Like all this, the whole tool chain that's fully open source. So it's inevitable that this thing will scale. Like, like to me, open source is efficiency and it's inevitable. Of course, the world doesn't think that right now there's huge gaps to that, but in my world it's it's just gonna happen sometime and we're trying to lead the way for it. So immersion training, it's a model where six months, I was thinking perhaps just the nominal figures are $3,000 per month, so like an $18,000 program, and during it you engage in immersion learning and the actual builds themselves so there would be extra revenue from people building stuff like for example we build a tractor get some revenue from that or actually in the program build the greenhouse or the house so we actually have a client who's paying for that we charge a small service fee of like say nominally we're thinking 10k ten thousand dollars to have some get a client to build them a house in five days using our swarm build method where we organize a team and have this full open source design stacked with ecological features we execute we get paid a little bit we try to make that into a replicable model but the idea is that we train people and the people run workshops at the same time as well so there's a dual revenue one from tuition from the students that we're actually uh, getting students here and running workshops at the same time um, during that training program so it's this this model where you got the two revenue streams and right now that's our that's our thought simply because this is not taking off we really need to spend the time to train people give them all the tools so they can pretty much design using open source tools all this stuff so you got your house design guide your tractor design guide you're basically focused on empowering the average person to get involved in this high level work because if you have the open source engineered modules you can take a simple package such as Sweet Home 3D. So that's what we use for Open Building Institute. You can take Sweet... Have you heard of Sweet Home 3D? No, I was having a look at it on the, uh, on the site. Yeah, it's, a, it's an open source interior design software, but you can just put your... Mod We're using that to put all our building modules in there, and we can drag and drop to make complete, technically correct designs using this very simple open source software. So that's what we're doing. For everything that we do, we want to generate this level of access that's unprecedented, kind of like you crack the thing for textbooks, we want to crack it for the material production economy kind of deal, you know. So that's where we are and the question is, I guess, uh, first of all, maybe some feedback here, but that's where we are and struggling to see, okay, what, how can we take, make this take off because we don't have staff really, but I thought that the student model, the university, the campus model could be a way to do that where you get, you're populating the world with people who can actually do that and getting R&D through that process so you address all these things at, at once. And 
and still remain true to this radically distributed decentralized organization. Of course, all the curriculum is free and open source. You come in to us to, to take our time so we can download all that to you in a rapid fashion. But of course, the full access is still there uh, for anyone who wants to go on their own. So we're totally into the concept of distributive enterprise. That's what we call it. Distributive enterprise meaning that we publish our business model as well so you can replicate it. So if you, here's how we build a 3D printer in a workshop, here's all the documents, here's a whole operations manual for how you can do the same, etc. So that's where we are. And it's a question of, yeah, this is going to go, it's like we're in this exponential, uh, I think we're kind of an exponential organization where this is going to take off, but it takes, it's just up front, it's we're trying to build that foundation to make it happen. And I think the best thing that's happened so far and why we're approaching you as well is, is the subject matter expertise that we can get from others to get all these designs in place. Like, for example, just recently got a guy who does home scale production of hydrogen for the house so we can have off grid energy in the house, solar hydrogen, you know, things like that. Get the best expert in some realm of endeavor, get them to load, download so that you have decades of experience downloaded in a few hours or days. You know, stuff like that. That's that's what we were thinking that the score is going to be. Just focus on the subject matter expertise. For you, I'd be going to, like, you know, really brainstorming on the open enterprise model. I mean, you as a successful open source entrepreneur, I, I think you have a lot of insight into this. So, yeah. Okay. Certainly okay. ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the next trillion dollar economy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I, I think I've got a few, maybe just a few small questions. Do you, given your, your experience, do you have an ideal persona in mind for the participants in this training workshop? People yeah, come that's... Come six months. Yeah, I mean, roughly, yes. I mean, it has to be a person who's absolutely dedicated or open to the open source culture. So the, the people with collaborative literacy, they have to be trainable. They have to be work as a team. But I mean, we're going to try to select, just be very, very selective and select the best candidates that have a skill set. I mean, so they have to be very intelligent, of course. I mean, broadly speaking, they have to be open source, um, trainable, not basically, I would call them movement entrepreneurs. Who is a movement entrepreneur or one who believes that possibility exists so that they would submit themselves to a program like that? So they have to be pretty entrepreneurial. Uh, to begin with. I think people can be trained a lot. It might be a younger profile, like a 20, you know, maybe someone straight out of high school possibly or early out of college. But uh, I find that a lot of people who are way older are really entrenched in various ways, unless they're the super creators who are probably just doing stuff themselves. So it may be the younger person that's susceptible to this. But no, that's going to be, that's a huge one. The HR on that, like how do you select your candidates and onboard them that's that's going to be the okay. central question um so i mean with the with textbooks it's it's easy to get people to say collaborate and participate because they they know who they're going to help and it's a it's, it's a much simpler exercise yours is yours is definitely more complicated um so the, the value proposition for those kinds of collaborative processes is that if you can provide the structure, people know that they're contributing to something meaningful. They need to know that they're contributing to a coherent framework that's going to actually have some impact yeah. in the long term. But in that instance, they won't drive it. And so I think there's a, one, this is more complicated, and two, there's more drive required, which is probably setting the obvious. But, um, but I think that's going to be a real that's going to be a real challenge to kind of make the value proposition for the participant. So, like, the so I guess my my question would be: Do you think their primary goal? So you said they need to be movement entrepreneurs. Do you think they go they the the satisfaction they're looking to get out of the entire exercise is going to be that they were part of a movement or that they can to do the workshops themselves I think it's definitely part of the movement because if you diffu we're trying to create an operating system a coherent framework of development so I would want this that they yeah. are in it as a lifestyle investor who's saying we are going to contribute to open source product development 
Now, there's another aspect which I talk about, and, I, and I, the land story is relevant to that. These facilities, land-based, so we have 30 acres here. The idea is to replicate such facilities the world over as the scaling model. I would see myself maybe being directly involved with like a dozen to make sure we know how to replicate that, make sure it works, and then I, I'm hoping for the the real number is actually a hundred thousand across the world within 17 years so starting with a pilot of two to four people next year double every single year that's my cunning plan uh, double every year from starting from like two to four pilot students and eventually end up getting a land parcel because part of the work that we're doing on the reg regenerative, so regenerative everything, regenerative agriculture, regenerative housing, regenerative industry, all of that, you have to have land to really understand what goes on. And we're already actually doing that right now. Right now we're getting involved in uh, one of the world's leaders. He's doing breeding of chestnuts and hazelnuts so that they're a perennial crop that can replace corn and soybeans in a, in a nutshell. So we're actually getting involved in that. Right now I'm actually doing two things. I'm running the Kickstarter and planting 5,000 nuts, these breed, breeding glaze, grade hazelnuts, using our tractor and flail mower and key line plow that's totally open source, which is radical. I'll put out a video on that. Um, but it's very important that we think about the perennial agriculture thing. And, and, and let me just fill you in on it, why it's important, because you probably aren't aware of this. Um, when when we do crops today, it's a constant battle of here's a new pest, here's a new pesticide, here's a new pest, new pesticides. It's an endless cycle. Uh, nature already has figured that out, and what humans can do is breed plants to the point that they come true from seed, such that the genetic adaptability continues over time. Instead of doing cloning or GMOs or cloning, cloning in particular, where you just take the same one and you propagate it like a fruit tree it's all a clone so it's very susceptible like all the major crops are just clones where there's very little happening in terms of genetic adaptability so what you want to do is breed the plant like the nut so it comes true from seed or the apple uh, it comes true from seed so one it's much easier to propagate and second you have actually addressed that endless cycle of chemical warfare that we're waging on a on a plant world so that's a that's a 500 year time scale proposition or decades decades it's it's people don't do that and that's why you've got all the pest problems because people don't think in the long term but we're we want to make a stake on that being one of the parts of the platform for open source ecology that we're actually taking care of the long-term future biodiversity of the planet uh, so that's where the land comes in that the facility would be on the agriculture part it would be some of this long-term breeding work that gets things that come true from seed just just to end this because you know apples Apple's actually in, in um, what do you call it? In where did the apples come from? They, they're, um, should, it escapes me where, the, Azerbaijan or somewhere, somewhere over there. But over there, they're actually, that's the only country I know of that actually grows apples that are true from seed, because they've done that over generations. Here in America, you gotta graft it, you gotta clone it, graft it. One, it's more difficult, it's kind of like more exclusive, but it doesn't get you that genetic adaptability. So there are examples where long term th this kind of stuff has happened, and I'm just making a point of that. I think it's important enough for future future prosperity of civilization that we want to get involved in it directly. So that's just a aside on the agriculture work. Yeah. Or just just to fill you in on that. Um, I'll tell you one thing that came to mind when thinking about your kind of ideal participants. So your bar is really high, which uh, makes sense, the, the kind of skill set movement entrepreneurs. But I was wondering, and I, and I can't validate this at all, if you, know, if you could teach people how to, and you, you, you can teach people um, how to build these machines, build, build these houses, and there's a bunch of people that would like to do that who aren't um, movement entrepreneurs, they don't probably have top-end skill set, but they probably want to build a house more badly than most people on the planet. Not for the, you know, not for the, um, for the satisfaction of, you know, building uh, 
keep house or entirely renewable, just, just to have a structure to live in. Mm -hmm. you know, so something in the developing world where I think, you know, the, the, they, they would make up for a lack of like sophisticated, possibly sophisticated training and an entrepreneur. They will have a very fundamental entrepreneurial spirit. They won't care about open source. They'll care about their own survival. I was wondering if you considered that not that open source wouldn't matter to them. In fact, it would be a fundamental enabler, but they wouldn't see themselves as, as the, mm -hmm. like drivers of an open source movement. They're people who would be mm -hmm. very survival and their livelihoods and their families would benefit from being able to leverage the stuff. And, you know, so we, we've seen that, like sometimes that's a, a way you can drive, to drive a lot of usage. Um, mm -hmm. Um, open is an enabler and not everyone is going to be uh, a champion of the move but there are a lot of people who will take it and run with it who and I think there's value in that you need the, the people that really understand the kind of philosophy and, and uh, kind of the call to action and, and the philosophical um, um, statement and kind of declaration of purpose but there's a lot of people that will work really really hard use these things because it fundamentally enables them to completely change their life um, in, in a positive way in yeah. a developing context. I don't know if you've kind of explored that at all. Okay, so so my initial, I haven't gone that road because every time I think about that, I'm thinking, okay, how do we get people that in the future are motivated to contribute directly to the open source product development? Because if you're going to open source the entire economy, you need a, you need a lot of people to do that. So if we let people just pretty much float away into, okay, well, this person is just going to build housing, what if they're not contributing back to the platform because they're too busy building housing or, or maybe surviving even? Uh, so I thought that the best design would be, well, why don't we have this requirement that we get people who actually care about open source product development as a fundamental core? Because the open source product development part, I guess that is the movement entrepreneurship part people who simply believe enough in that that they're willing to collaborate in a bigger movement to make that happen but I see your point that if you just get the usage up then maybe like all the other stuff might just fall into place you know is that so I, I learned it, it's what it, it's not one or the other you need both you can't just have the kind of philosophers you can't just yeah. have the people work on policy and yeah but I do think that there's re value in the transformative story, right? So, mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine uh, recently built an app which helps, a very simple app, but um, he's an ophthalmologist, and uh, so it helps them diagnose people with cataracts in rural areas, and there are very few ophthalmologists in South Africa, but a cataract operation is an outpatient operation, someone's blind, then they can see. It's completely transformative. Um, mm -hmm. So, in terms of getting funding, and continuing those that that story that very very real impact um, has been, been incredibly powerful and his, his results he's got um, orders of magnitude increased efficiency in a couple of the local hospitals through using the app just in terms of it's a scheduling problem the diagnosis and scheduling problem but um, but it's actually the app isn't very fancy and it can do a lot more I mean it will do a lot more soon um, but that's that's really helped, and I think this it's not just having you know a poster child story where or poster like this poster story where you have you have one person that built a house, but if you can show that it's having transformative impact relatively early on, um, I think there's value in that, and I think I don't think you should think it, it has to be one or the other. Um, I think I think the two can go hand in hand, mm -hmm. but if there's a real-world application by other people who don't have to be zealots. Your case to anyone for funding, uh, for support, um, it doesn't have to be funding. All, all manner of support, media uh, support, fun, financial support, material support, etc., um, is, is so much greater because they can see where it goes immediately. Because I think sometimes the, the big vision is just a little bit... You know, it's all aligned with the big vision, but I think if, uh, if that can be a bit much for a lot of people to grasp, and it's a really long play, 
So, you know, grass, grassroots impact, I think, can help sustain that. And it doesn't, I don't believe it means giving up any of your kind of ideals or philosophy. I'm just wondering if, you know, it might be that there are people who would build many houses. So uh, how, how do I how to operationalize this? So, so training pro like would this fit within the training program? So, but do a, like a lower brow, like phase in from the lowest kind of like here's the simple training to the most advanced and kind of roll them out in parallel. Or yeah, so I think let, let's let's adopt the the tech sector uh, jargon and talk. Of, so, like what's the minimum viable house you could build, for example? Right. And what right. could you train somebody to do that, right? So, like, yeah. if all the, you, there's a, people you're just going to give the tools, but if they build, it's like habitat for humanity a little bit. Yeah. Like, it, yours is a lot more sophisticated than that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of low cost housing going on in South Africa getting built. And, I mean, they're trying to, I mean, so I drive to the airport and you see it. Um, every, every house has now got solar panels and things like that. But, and there's a lot of people doing agriculture. You've kind of pulled all of those threads together really beautifully. And I think actually there's a lot of people that just don't even know. They never thought as far as you have about how you can put it all together. Um, but anyway, okay, so this is a, it's a little bit of a digression. But I, I guess I think if the opportunity arose to actually have somebody just say, I'm going to build 100 houses using your technique, mm -hmm. I think there's, there's real value. Um, yeah, I so think the people would be really driven to do that would be in the developing world. In the developing world where we have no no familiarity with it. You see we're in the states, right? So Yeah, you know. So I I think no, no so I'm, I'm okay, so that's why I said it's a little bit of a digression. So I, let me leave it with if, you know, people from this context came to your immersion workshop so that they could do that, but just build lots and lots of houses. Um, I think there might be some value in there, and I think it so, might be worth um, connecting you with some people that might be interested in that. Okay, so one side is, so we run a five-day build, for example, November 4, we're going to run a five-day build of the Eco Seed Home, and then we're going to build yeah. the Aquapana Greenhouse on top of that in another five days. So that's the experience where we thought, okay, we just present that, and once people see that, it's going to replicate like wild. So so why hasn't it? Our solution is, well, it takes a lot of skill to do that. So therefore, um, we need to train people. Now, it could also be that maybe the product is not good enough yet, or it's not impressive enough. But I think the thing we have to really offer, the, the, the real value is the five-day build process, the parallel swarming build. And... And that, of course, is, is met with challenges, too, because now we're looking into codes, and if the schedule for inspection does not meet the five-day schedule, then we're screwed, you know? For example, yeah. so there's there's many, many challenges, and we're going to figure it all out, right? Because, obviously, this can be done. So, okay, but back to the question of, okay, what's the minimum viable product? How do we, how do we roll this out in a simpler way? Well, so, so my point was there's the five-day where you just build it, and you see the immersion of that, but then there's the training, like, you know, weeks, months, where you actually learn how to, you actually run that process. And I think, I mean, if you're going to run that whole process, I think, like, it'll take you six months to learn it. And it's, it'll be immersion learning, you know. So, if we assume that it takes that long to build it, or maybe we can th think about, okay, well, let's get, strip this down, make it simpler, as simple as possible, so that maybe in... Uh, in two months or one month you can learn the basic framework that's also doable it won't have all the features but it'll be a minimum viable product that's absolutely buildable I think maybe I mean that's that's one way to go it's not ex exciting for me because I see so much more potential and I feel like we're almost missing out on things that could e relatively easily be accomplished so like I keep thinking when you say okay well why don't you strip it down I keep thinking well yeah but why if it's only a matter of a person's consciousness. That's why it would be easier. Like, can we find people who are consciously open to that possibility? That's why this openness to learning is absolutely critical. But would we not be able to find people who, who say, 
oh yeah, that's just all I need to find from in a candidate is, yes, I think that's possible, period. Like if someone can tell me that, they'll be willing to learn. The thing that we've found as an issue with many people is up front, they either don't see it, how it can happen, or they can't do it themselves or whatever, and immediately you get the, the psychological blocks. And, and, and I, I keep thinking that, man, we got to be able to find somebody who does not have psychological blocks. Why not? It would have to be someone who's on like a psychedelic guy or whoever who's been open, opened up or by whatever means they're either young enough or innocent enough or drugged up enough that they believe it. <laughs> but the psychological barriers are one of the, the cultural psychological barriers that we're finding are significant. Um, so what's what's the best solution here? Yeah. So yeah, there are most certainly people people that can see the big picture, but I mean I think they won't be the vast majority of people. The world is in pretty poor shape at the moment mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of the average person. Right. In my opinion. Right. Um, uh, I do think if you if you're going to be successful, you're going to need Something, some, some, some part of it that's a steady pipeline. Even if it's, even if it's, um, yeah, I, I got I, the last few years I've had bootstrapping beaten into me. You know, it's going to be years before we build what we really, really want to build. Uh, but we have to earn the right to play, and so we've got to, we've got to do a lot to get there. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I do think, I do think there's value. Oh, it could be cynical. Like it might be that you find the sweet spot that people will pay for. That's a like a ten or fifteen day thing. Um, uh -huh. that you can push a lot of people, and you're saying like, okay, uh -huh. just suck it up because there's going to be revenue, right? And that'll help with the bigger picture. And then you kind of hold on it. I mean, I, 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 unfortunately, uh -huh. some compromises are quite somewhere. There's got to be a steady pipeline. I think to, to make it compelling, you're going to need gonna have to find this spot somewhere. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and maybe it's just the right recruiting. I mean, maybe you can. So I, I don't know what the. This is a. This is. A, see, it's a substantially more complex uh, um, project that you've got, and it's substantially more time. So maybe you can get a steady pipeline of people through a six months and six months of immersion training. So uh, let me back up. So at the. Um, Philosophically, I think immersion training is a really good idea. So, tick that box. Um, mm -hmm. I was just wondering how people would buy into six months of something like that. Uh huh. Uh, which is why is there another group of people who are driven for a different reason. And you're trying to find people who are driven just for because they believe in open source and they want to drive a movement. But what if there's people who will come and do six months of this because they desperately want to build houses for their, you know, their families or something like that. So that that's how I went there. Uh -huh. so I was just wondering about six months. And it might be that it's just, you know, recruiting. It might just be getting the message right. Um, um, mm -hmm. Maybe you can. Well, you're I, saying... I, I've never tried... Sorry, you say... Maybe we can get the message right for the full depth immersion or like for for the smaller sweet spot model. Well, both. So both. Mm -hmm. So, right. I mean, I think it's going to, there'll be more people for something shorter. I mean, certainly instant gratification is part of the modern kind of culture um, in general. Mm -hmm. But um, but I'm thinking with very good messaging and very, very clear picture, you might be able to get lots of people to do the six month thing as well. Um, yeah. But I think it'll yeah. be easier to get something shorter. I think it should. I don't think you should abandon the six-month idea. Um, I think you should be very um, invest a lot of time and thinking um, and bouncing around how you message that. Um, app, you know, just to make sure. You, and and sometimes it's not. It, there's always the message and the channel. And sometimes you, I've I've just discovered. You know, the channel can make a uh, because the of the way. Um, all the other businesses run and how media markets and segments things and things like that they're so effective that machinery is so large that actually un i mean unfortunately you have to leverage 
which channel gets to which people. So you need to know exactly who you're looking for. You need to know exactly what your message is. And you need to know exactly which is the best channel to get that message to them. Um, so that was a, we had a disaster. It was really simple. We, our channel for getting people to our websites completely missed the people that were really interested in paying for our, our value-added service um, okay. when we first went live. Okay. So, so just missed it completely. Uh, so we were getting like more than more than enough traffic, but it was not quite the right people. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. So um, but that does make a difference. Um, and then I do think uh, um, the something shorter that you can make a steady pipeline to build up a base because you build up people who are kind of predisposed to your project who um become advocates if, mm-hmm. if you can do something for 15 days or whatever or 10 days with them yeah that's really satisfying for them they'll go uh-huh. and talk about it um you know so they they invest some time and some money in doing something you make sure that they get an achievement out of it so if they got something to show for it then that's uh, that's a big deal for them um and that will help and there would be a network to leverage right so can always try to get them to buy into something. So maybe they won't be able to design new machines, but you want to, if they once they're bought in and they go through a good process, you want to lock them into this broader community somehow, right? So build, like keep them part of the community. And you want to continuously try to leverage them, and some of them will come back, and some of them might build up to being your advocates. They'll see what's happening, that we're successful. You know, you might have uh, MVP one type thing and an MVP type thing and people will come in stages and build up and things like that um yeah so i think i think that that's another that's another idea um to try to try to build up i'll give it some more i mean i i haven't i didn't give it a lot of the, the scaling challenge much thought to coming into the conversation so this is just sort of shooting from the hip here and i should try to give it give it some more and I, I know some people who have been... <laughs> sorry, sorry, uh, Mark. Space sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. just for a uh, second. Sorry, sorry. I'm, uh, I'm showing your I'm, uh, your uh, entry at the Shuttleworth Foundation. Did you know that they put Global Village Construction set under your name at the shuttleworthfoundation.org? I just noticed that. No. I'm... Maybe they they foresaw your future. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, no, I, I, we should point it out to them. They say it says Mark Horner Global Village Construction set instead of Sia Vula or something. Okay, anyway, that's on your profile page at the Shuttleworth Foundation. Okay, but no, sorry, go back to go back to uh, what you were saying. It seems that the... Go ahead. No, go um, ahead. No, 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 so... Um, yes, yeah, so I'll, give, I'll give more thought to the, the scalability thing, but I really right. think you need to build up a bunch of advocates. You need an army out there. I mean, you need an army of, of high-end people, but you don't, they will emerge. Um, I don't think you can okay. You can get there right away. It'll so that's, time to get there. that is consistent um, with the modular, um, would, modular approach. Sorry? That is consistent with a modular approach where we phase things in in small bite-sized chunks and that's kind of the the feedback i got from others as well because if we do the big program at best it will be made up of very small units however the critical part is for those small units to be economically productive like we train you to do this business this small business this thing or that um so it has to be substantial enough but yeah definitely should be a microcosm like for example we start by training people how to run 3d printer workshops for example which are used for example to make also the the glazing for the aquaponic greenhouse on a larger scale if you scale up the 3d printer etc like uh, start with piece by piece you know yeah okay have you so i don't know what their ethos is um so it might might be a challenge but um have you and I, and I don't actually know much about them, but like an organization like Habitat for Humanity. Right. Um, can you not make more efficient? That, uh, and I just, I have no idea. That's a, that's a great question. I think the answer would be absolutely yes. And um, why haven't we struck a chord yet? Um, closest was a group, a Habitat group somewhere on the East Coast. We were talking about using our machines, but maybe it's that we didn't have enough 
traction at that point, I think that's absolutely worth exploring. Work with other groups like that and see what they say regarding the feasibility of this. Because if they say, oh, well, that's great, but you can't do it in our framework because of this and that, you know, that's feedback. So, yeah, we should um, definitely try to look for strategic partnerships like that, which basically shake down piece by piece. The best case would be we show that we have a model that does five-day builds instead of doing, you know, like long drawn-out builds. You can do things extremely rapidly. I could see them working. I could see the opposite side of that is if you got too many skilled carpenters, they're not going to give up their techniques for a totally different build system because I've seen that kind of industrial inertia quite a bit. Like uh, people would come like I actually like it when like whenever there's a skilled tradesman coming to our to our workshops, I'm kind of more careful with them so that they don't impose various other techniques that might be not relevant in the con present case into the whole show so that that may be a definite block but yeah it's worth exploring mm -hmm. yeah so I, I i think well yeah definitely worth exploring i'm just busy quickly looking at the habitat for humanity south africa page so i don't know the people that run it but that will give you your developing context and they're a global network i don't know how they build you know, I, haven't, I haven't done a, a habitat for humanity um so yeah, I, I have. Should look them up. Yeah, um, no, I have. I've participated in that long time ago, maybe a decade or two ago. I mean, typically it's uh, just standard construction methods. So the the key would be, are people actually willing to say, okay, we're going to scrap our existing designs completely for this new, different, new and different building system? It would definitely be a cultural challenge. Because because the way we build is it's just a little different, that. you know. Go ahead. But you. What, what you do is, if a community wanted to collaborate to build, you've got a better technique. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, rather than volunteers. So, right. you know, it can start with having humanity and the local community all collaborating to build houses. But actually, if the machines are built, like, uh, you know, uh, from the global construction kit, um, those kinds of machines can be left there. People can leverage that to continue to use it. Um, in in a context where people are desperate for houses, I think I think it'll it'll carry on. Um, yeah, but okay. So I think that's definitely definitely worth it. Yeah, it would be um, worth looking at. You know, okay. So what is the cost structure? Like, for example, if you are you familiar with the habitat people in South Africa? I've just looked them up. No, I, I don't know, but I think I could get an introduction to the, some of the. Yeah. yeah, so so for example, yeah, because South Africa keeps coming up a lot. I mean, it's uh, I think you guys are good on a bricks. It's a it's a it would be a great place to do the compressed earth block. But the question is, what is the price structure of the current work, and what advantage do we have? That how how does it exactly fit? And also like the thing like just from hearing all these horror stories about habitat or some up no not I don't know I don't know if it's habitat but all these aid programs where you know all the money gets embezzled or like turned into making a complex for prostitutes or something whatever like just just horror stories like I, I'm being really careful about not jumping out too far because I know my backyard here I kind of know in America a little more what that's about so that's just my my concerns about that mm -hmm. so uh, okay, but I I know some people involved with Habitat for Humanity, so okay, no I'll 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 put out I'll find out more about their local work, how they decide what to build, it. Right, right. right. Uh, but the um, as you said, all the codes that you're going to have to adhere to, so there's still that work. Right. But um, but I think what you what you put together is a, is a much nicer community picture. And there's a lot of work going on to build farms and things like that where people can grow, you know, grow their own food, um, even in, in the townships. Um, mm -hmm. So we need much more. You know, food security is a serious issue, right? So um, I, I think, yeah, I think, I think it meshes things really nicely. So Yeah, and if you look I, at the... I need to, I'll need to... Take a look at our aquaponic greenhouse because that's turning out to be pretty powerful. I mean, people are really excited about it. We've got one on this house here. We're going to build a second one this this fall. Yeah. 
It's a very productive system, and it looks and like it's working. Okay, and you've got some stats on what it can produce, right? Yeah, yeah. We haven't run it as a commercial operation, but for this this year, I mean, basically, you have forty eight towers that have twenty two growing holes. There's fish underneath, but a thousand plants a month from an eight hundred square foot space. Basically, we're trying to do a model, a replicable model, where you can show $2,000 of profit per month using that. So you got primarily the the vegetables. The fish, not so much, because there's the production is three pounds per day. Money-wise, money that's not huge. It's much less than the greens and things. But that okay. plus microgreens and sprouts, we're looking at developing a model specifically with those three as... A real solid revenue model so we're, we're working on that yeah but I think that's it's very exciting that your house now that's becomes good. a center of production you get producing your energy producing your food I mean it's it's really exciting I, I, I see this is gonna take off um, and once again just to fill you in on why okay why so what's new well aquaponics complex system but the thing that we do like we have say one of the world's leaders on integrated pest management so we know how to do it beyond organic you know not even organic it's like beyond with with integrated pest management so we're, we've got those tools coming in a pipeline because we're integrating all this open source subject matter expertise mm -hmm. okay okay well I'll, I'll definitely find out some more about the local the habitat for you yeah but it seems like the the summary is yeah just you know phase it in modularly start by one one model at a time maybe strip down the house to the absolute like the least features like wouldn't have all the ecological stuff like even the brick like you can do the house without the brick just using standard construction lumber like all the stuff from a big box store and it still works you know uh, okay. for the rapidness but it won't have the ecological material as much. It won't have the compressed earth block that's dug from the site, you know. So, I mean, you can do various tweaks and questions. We want to find that sweet spot, I guess. What's what's sustainable enough that it's interesting, or it's simply that it addresses plain the need to massively make housing, and it's not super ecological. I mean, I'd hate that, but um, whichever way allows us to get the R&D happening that we get the full package and make it cheaper faster better the quicker um, but I, so yeah so I think I, I think some I mean I think there's room to do some of the ecological stuff um, yeah given, definitely you know well global climate change and all of that stuff um, yeah so I, I, yeah but the, figuring out exactly what the tweet spot is is going to be going to be something key and then making sure there's a continuous pipeline and then I think you're finding some, some potential partners. Um, yeah, so so the sweet spot applies to the what is the product sweet spot and also then the training sweet spot. If we define a product sweet spot, then what's the training sweet spot? Yeah. Because the thing okay. right now is too large, I mean. Yeah. For day one, I think, yeah. yeah. Those are my random thoughts, but uh, just going forward, so I'll I will harass the local new uh, habitat for humanity people. But what uh, what else can I do? Or, uh, so I would like. Kind of, I'm not. Yeah. So so based on your track record as an like the thing that's attractive about you, you live in an open source world, so you subscribe to open culture. You know how that works, and you're also a successful entrepreneur. And I would like to tout that as the last I heard, you're the most successful Shuttleworth fellow on this planet, if not the universe. So you 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 probably oh oh don't be don't don't be humble. <laughs> no no you're good. Um, but the thing is, okay, I think you can help us a lot in terms of because of your unique perspective on open source entrepreneurship. So I would like to invite you to be an advisor for Open Building Institute. Um, the formal requirement there is an hour per quarter 
which is very minimal okay. of consulting time with yep. with one or two more people and then we just need your bio and things like that and we can start like that and if you if you have more time and you can think about these things or help us figure stuff out the main thing i'd like you know constant vetting of the business model like how do we really do this how do we scale this open source enterprise so if you can have this check-ins on a regular basis at least once a quarter on how that's going okay. that would help us and then you can of course you know help us get contacts of other people who can help and things like that since you're a, you're connected to certain things mm -hmm. do you have a I mean do you have a legal entity registered? for open source ecology yes we're a nonprofit organization that's tax exempt for open building institute it's currently unincorporated it's a sole proprietorship right now but we were thinking about so Katerina my wife who's another TED fellow, yeah. we got married and we, we started this stuff together. She's an open source hardware advocate and she started the Open Building Institute uh, based on the work of the Global Village Construction Set using the tools and while people don't understand a the tractor, they understand a the house much better. So. Okay. No, no, I was just wondering. Okay, cool. Well, so I'll, I, I can send you a bio and stuff. That's not a problem. Um, okay. No, I think that I will think about it, and then I will I'll just harass you over email if I have any other cool. Yeah, yeah, and I think what we want to do is at this point, like what I'll do is I'll start a document because the scaling question is huge. In fact, we're working with I got a coach from TED, um, Cameron Harold, okay. who is uh, do you know Cameron Harold? Uh, he is like the guru of of scaling he's a business coach advisor and he started 1-800-GOT-JUNK so he's built huge companies that doubled like every year so okay. he's the tops in the field but I want to start a document where we start just shaking down okay this is our current idea of what we can do here and just shaking down assumptions like basically we got to test out these concepts like um, I mean first of all like does that model which we use to build things rapidly can it scale to more people or is it because we're so small at this point that we still have clients you know like can we replicate massively this this swarm building technique I think we can we have to test that but that may be a you know maybe we won't succeed at that anything is pos possible I think there's good evidence that it can succeed I think the better questions are to ask how does it succeed you know under what conditions etc but if we can start a document I'll just I'll just to kind of do like a running log okay here's our model like that we just start refining over time and getting input from some of the best minds as far as how can this go forward yeah and I can share that with cool. you and we can start testing assumptions yeah that sounds good yeah okay cool okay all right so I think that does it. I think that does it for now. I think uh, we'll keep in touch. We'll get you on our board of advisors. Great to have you. Um, and if you run into any other people, like if you know, keep your eyes out for people. You know, people who in the space or in the open source scaling world. How do we, you know, how do we do this better? Yeah. And is there anything we can do to help you in terms of um, what we're doing or? Because one thing we did talk about, I, I remember in our conversation in, at MIT there, we uh, talked briefly about the hacker spaces. Did you do anything, any further work on that regarding the, when you got your test book, textbooks, you also were talking about some community centers where it would be like hacker spaces? No, uh, so that, no, uh, we've never, we haven't had resources to pursue that at all, unfortunately. But I was just harassing somebody online just before this call who actually runs one of the, it's literally about 150 meters from our office, uh, the local, it's called Kick-Ass Technology, but it's a, it's essentially a maker space. Mm -hmm. um, and they, I just sent her the link uh, to, to OBI, so I'll harass her in the morning about that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so unfortunately I didn't make much progress on that. Right. I have lots of aspirational dreams. Man, it takes a long time to get stuff done. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's but the thing is, uh, just to let you know, I mean, hacker spaces, so, you know, structures of all types, from greenhouses to barns to houses to hacker spaces, production facilities, that's within the scope. 
down the road we want to build these turnkey fully open source equipped hacker spaces which by the way the fab lab movement has not produced i mean they're all using proprietary machines primarily so i mean that to me is yeah. kind of like a missed opportunity because of the price point for entry but um yeah so that's something definitely we you know we can talk about in the future about that as well mm -hmm. yeah I, i'm meaning to have uh, i haven't actually met her before but we connected online we've exchanged a bunch of emails but she literally works around the corner so i need to have lunch with her and have yeah a chance. and this is cape town you're in cape town yeah yeah yep so and the the local government's quite involved in Habitat for Humanity here as well. And I know the, the person that runs the local government through education. But, you know, once you've got the, you've got the intro, you, it, it's all good. So we, we met a few times. I'll, yeah. I can ask her about it as well. Yeah. Because uh, so gov government money can be useful. They do have a lot of it. It just needs to be channeled appropriately. They're renowned for not channeling it appropriately. <laughs> but, uh, but every now and then it does work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah, so we'll follow up with the email then. Yeah. Okay, Mark. Well, thanks so much for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. No stress. Cheers, man. Okay. Cheers. Take care.